Towards a New Socialism Section The Environment and Natural Resources In Chapter 4, we made reference to the need for a socialist economy to adopt an environmentally sound growth policy. This section discusses some of the specific implications of this goal and assesses the relative merits of market and planned systems with regard to environmental issues. Some further relevant points will be developed in Chapter 14, where the focus is on the kind of property relations required to ensure the careful husbanding of natural resources. Up to this point, we have assumed that the cost of producing any good or service is adequately captured by the total human labor time expended in its production. In a recent critique of socialist planning, Don Lavoie, 1985, raises once again an old objection concerning the inadequacy of labor values for dealing with the costs of non-reproducible natural resources. The argument is that a costing in terms of labor values fails to deal with natural or non-labor inputs. In a market system, natural resources have a price tag and enter into costs of production. Under the labor theory of value, they are free. Thus, it is argued, the labor theory will underestimate the cost of goods produced from scarce natural resources. A serious issue is at stake here. But this argument, which originated with von Mises, can be turned against the advocates of the market, as the rational use of natural resources is capitalism's weakest point, and potentially socialism's strongest. How is the free market price of natural resources determined? The classical answer is that it comes from differential ground rent. In that case, the marginal land or oil field or forest comes free, and the cost of production at the margin comes from the labor, and in neoclassical theory, capital, inputs. But the oil from the marginal well is a depletable resource too, and in a market system, this depletion has no price. There is only a finite amount of oil, but this is not recognized in its market price. Indeed, what we have seen with capitalism has been a reckless destruction of natural resources wherever the resource has been at the margin. Here, it is worth recalling the point that Marx makes about the American frontier, where the quality of land improved as colonists moved out of the coastal states and onto the plains. As the marginal land, in geographical terms, became the most productive land, which, moreover, could be had free as it was stolen from the Indians. All constraints on natural resource exploitation were removed. Hence, agricultural practices, absence of crop rotation, monocultures, were adopted, which led to rapid soil exhaustion. These characteristics, in the most market-oriented of economies, led to the catastrophic soil erosion of the Dust Bowl. The same holds for timber exploitation at the margins. Timber stolen from native peoples by capitalist companies is treated as a free resource on the west coast of North America, or the jungles of Amazonia and Borneo, and forests that have taken thousands of years to develop are cut down in a few decades. The only circumstance in which a market system will lead to a husbanding of land and preserve its fertility is if there is a landowning class that derives its revenue from ground rent and has a vested interest in preserving that revenue. Technically, this presupposes a differential rent arising from diminishing returns at the margin. Politically, it presupposes that the landowning class is rich politically sophisticated, and backed by the state power. 
This combination only occurs under specific historical circumstances. In most parts of the world, during the capitalist era, the land has been held up by poor peasants or hunter-gatherers with little access to political power. Their natural resources have been simply expropriated. Moreover, whether it is rational for landlords to husband a resource or to mine it, destroying soil fertility, etc., will depend upon the discount rate. At any positive discount rate, it makes sense to deplete non-renewable resources. At low and stable discount rates, it may be economically viable to carry out investments that enhance the quality of the land, as was done by the 18th century British landlord classes. But here we are dealing with slowly renewable resources rather than non-renewable ones. In sum, the market will in all cases waste resources at the margin, whether returns are increasing or diminishing. It will husband slowly renewable resources at low discount rates in combination with diminishing marginal returns. It will always deplete non-renewable resources. The introduction of imputed rents into a socialist economy, as was advocated by Soviet reformers, is equivalent to performing calculations of labor values using marginal rather than average costs and assuming diminishing returns to labor. But given the arguments above, imputed rents under socialism will be no more effective in husbanding resources than real rents are under capitalism. We would argue the more radical point that ecological destruction is the result of any economic decision mechanism, i.e. any decision mechanism based upon a single objective function. Any decision procedure based upon prices fails to convey information about the ecological and environmental consequences of a course of action. Since these are complex and not reducible to an accounting entry, any non qualitative assessment of environmental impact is misleading. The environmental consequences of a course of action have to be determined by scientific investigation and resolved by political struggle. Examples of this have been the campaigns waged by the scientific community in the USSR to stop industrial development on the shores of Lake Baikal and to halt the plans to divert Siberian rivers south to irrigate Central Asia. There is no guarantee that wise decisions will be taken on these issues. The most that can be asked for is that political conditions exist to allow free and informed de de debate on the issue, along with freedom of scientific investigation and publication, and that a final decision is taken by a free vote. In a capitalist country, such decisions are almost invariably arrived at to suit the commercial interests of big companies who are able to buy political influence. In a socialist democracy, major environmental issues should be settled by referendum after a prolonged and open debate in the media. If a hydroelectric scheme is proposed that will flood a valley, which is both a beauty spot and a unique habitat, it is pointless to search for some economic formula that will decide if the project should go ahead. The problem is political, not economic. That is to say, a decision requires a deliberate judgment of priorities and cannot be reduced to a comparison of simple numbers, whether expressed in labor time or money. The question of resource depletion is paradoxical because policies of rapid depletion and extreme conservation lead to similar results. 
if we use up North Sea oil in one big boom lasting a few years, then future generations are deprived of it. But if we leave it in the ground permanently, then again we are all deprived of the use of it. The prudent alternative is to plan to use up the oil at such a speed and in such a way as will enable us to develop substitutes for it before it runs out. There is little evidence to show that the market is doing this. On the other hand, there was some evidence of this being done in a systematic way in the USSR. For the last 30 years, the Soviets consistently devoted considerable resources to thermonuclear fusion research in the hope of developing a replacement for fossil fuels. Western machines like the Joint European Taurus, JET, derive from the Soviet Tokamak designs. And in the course of 1987, with the launch of the new energy heavy lift vehicles, it transpired that a major objective of the Soviet space program was the development of solar energy. Projected use of these vehicles include the placement of orbiting mirrors to provide illumination of Arctic work sites during the winter months, and the construction of orbiting solar power plants to transmit microwave power back down to Earth. This sort of long-term project can be undertaken by a socialist economy as part of the normal planning mechanism. The market mechanism can never do it. Capitalist countries can only compete in this area insofar as they set up special state agencies that mimic socialist planning. NASA or the CEGB. End section.